So, uh, so I'm James Neal, welcome to our webinar today which is Understanding Water Hammer in Steam and Condensate Systems. Um, and so yes, yeah, so just as we get underway today, just as a quick overview, we're going to start out with a bit of a uh, understanding what water hammer is, um, figuring out is this actually normal, we're going to discuss the four main causes of water hammer, how to avoid it, and we're going to talk about a couple of examples. Um, I'm not at liberty to discuss specific examples. Um, funnily enough, um, a lot of sites that have had water hammer issues tend to uh, not want to publicise it, but I'm going to talk about some generic uh, examples and, and things to watch out for and, 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 and what to avoid. Okay, so, so water hammer can be a little destructive. Um, it can cause injury to people and also can cost a lot of money reflected in repairing damaged equipment. Um, in addition to obviously the obvious safety considerations, there's also the reality that it can uh, cause significant downtime um, and other process uh, reliability issues. Uh, even not so much from just downtime, but the impacts it can have in terms of process control, um, temperature, and we'll talk about some of these later on today. Okay, so. So what is water hammer? Well, just to, to back up a little bit, typically we're going to talk um, with specific reference to steam and condensate systems today. And so what we want to need to remind ourselves is typically in a steam system, your steam velocities will be between 20 and 30 metres a second or between sort of say 70 and 100 kilometres an hour. Now condensate velocities in comparison, obviously the, uh, the liquid phase in our two phase steam condensate mixture, where you have condensate, typically your velocities of that condensate will be in the order of one to two metres a second. So greater than an order of magnitude slower. Um, now obviously where you have both condensate and steam in a pipe, um, you can form a slug of water or condensate and then if you've got steam pressure behind that uh, condensate, that can then accelerate that plug of uh, liquid as it uh, obviously increases to the speed of the steam velocity. Um, and obviously when that sluggy condensate comes to a sudden change in direction, okay, that kinetic energy in that water obviously gets released, causing mechanical damage and a loud banging noise that you typically hear. Um, now this is what we call as water hammer. Now elbows, bends, tees, um, heat exchanger tubes, headers, valves are all likely to be affected as they change the direction of the fluid flow or provide a constriction. So a uh, little bit of a sound file for you to listen to for those of you that may not have actually directly heard how bad it can sound. So each one of those bangs is an impact occurring in a piece of pipe somewhere. And uh, there'll be some of you out there that have not actually seen it, but there'll be others that'll go, uh-huh, we've seen what this damage causes. And uh, um, it doesn't take much. You could uh, plug into Google Images and you could get plenty of images of damaged uh, um, steel where it's been literally destroyed by nothing more than a bit of water. Um, if you think about it, um, you know, you think water in a pipe, how much damage can it cause? But then you can go down to plenty of engineering shops and there's actually uh, a, a, a well-known solution for cutting steel is actually a high pressure water jet. You know, with, with water under the right pressure, you can cut steel. Now, obviously those pressures are relatively high, but in a practical sense, what you're seeing with water hammer over and over again is a lower pressure, but through sheer continuity, um, ultimately that damage is caused over time. It's a bit like um, the old stonemason uh, chiseling away at a piece of stone. Is it the last hit that's done it or is it the cumulative of, of many hundreds of hits together collectively that will crack that stone, um, be it granite or, or anything else? I mean even di diamonds as hard as they are ultimately can be um, um, faced and, and uh, and uh, finished and, and polished and, and broken and so forth. So just a reminder that this thing, water, if it's not dealt with correctly, will damage your equipment. Okay, it's obviously a safety issue. Um, and obviously 
in worst case scenarios can be fatal. Now, the reality is, is all of this is preventable. Okay, so I really want to emphasize this point today. At no time is water hammer in any steam system a normal or acceptable occurrence. Now, you can apply that same principle to your, uh, your water reticulation system. Same scenario where rules apply. Now, you've got less types of water hammer that apply in those systems, but in the same case, water hammer for an ideal, efficient, and reliable system is not acceptable. So if you're looking at accepting a new build or a uh, remedial sort of upgrade to a system and you have water hammer, you should ensure that that's actually a non-conforming um, performance on that system and it would need to be rectified. Okay, so water hammer is a sign of a poor system, be it through design, could be incorrect construction, um, improper or un uh, unoptimized or, or, or incorrect control, um, could be an operational issue or could well be a maintenance issue. Now we'll discuss a few of these today. Um, the reality is I hear a lot of people talking about um, their maintenance of their high pressure steam systems and the number of sites up and down the country both here and around the world have regular annual maintenance spends on uh, reconditioning valves, control valves and and, uh, and traps and other bits and pieces. The reality is, is all of that equipment can have a substantially extended life beyond the sort of annual um, expenditure in terms of your line maintenance. And what it comes back to is getting things installed correctly and then operated correctly and then being maintained correctly. So just to reiterate that point, you can extend the life of your high pressure steam assets. It is quite doable. It's just that you need to do things correctly. To give you an idea, an example of this, and I think I may have mentioned this once or twice before, if you go to New York City in the US, like many other cities in the, uh, the Northeast in particular, they actually have steam as a utility. It's one of the largest reticulated steam networks in the world. They have steam valves in that system where they get and expect to get 20 years service out of those valves without them being re-kitted on an annual basis. Now this is a system that's in operation for probably six months a year and they have plenty of downtime through the summer obviously, but that equipment is not being pulled out and refitted every year through good design and good specification, good control, good operation, good maintenance, these things are achievable. It's about acknowledging that this sort of performance is not actually acceptable. Okay, so where do we find water hammer? Any fluid system. Now most pronounced um, water hammer is in a multi-phase fluid systems. What we mean by that, and, and steam is a really good example where you have both a liquid and a vapor phase, and obviously in a steam condensate systems, and a lot of the time the, uh, the phases are what we call saturated meaning that the temperature of the stream is at the saturation temperature for the given pressure that it's at. So for example, if you have condensate um, in a steam system that's being, being condensed from steam in a heat exchanger, that condensate with the steam in the heat exchanger will actually be saturated, i.e. it will be at the uh, saturation temperature, meaning that any slight changes can cause some of that condensate to flash, which is indeed what happens. We talked about this a few webinars ago where we talked about flash steam, and especially after a steam trap, for example, some of that condensate will indeed flash, meaning that you've still got a saturated mixture, but you'll be at a lower temperature corresponding to the lower pressure. But what happens, of course, is the, the, the key thing with these saturated multi-phase fluid systems is that fluid can change phase very quickly from the liquid to the, uh, to the vapour phase and when that does that it can be quite explosive and we'll talk a little bit more about that today as we go along. Now in a typical steam or condensate system, water hammer is going to be most pronounced or severe on startup, can also be an issue on shutdown and we'll, we'll come to this a little later today. It's a lot actually to do with what you do on shutdown and how you control and manage your system on shutdown that can have a direct impact 
on what happens when you start the system back up again. So there are many instances up and down the country where these systems are started and um, start stop on sort of a daily or more frequent basis. Certainly in the food industry that's the case. Not so much in the uh, sort of pulp and paper sector where it's a little bit more continuous in the uh, nature of the process. But uh, nonetheless, uh, depending on, on the nature of what sort of system you're running, the startup shutdown may or may not be a big deal. However, the result's still the same at startup is where most of the damage will occur. Now, what's the result of water hammer? Well, ultimately, you'll have ruptured pipes. Now, to be fair, when you've got a ruptured pipe, it's a little bit late. Um, what often will preempt that, of course, is if you see broken pipe supports. So this is where, as you wander around a lot of these factories, you'll see uh, pipe supports that have uh, either got uh, cracking or, or signs of wear and then you'll see them actually completely disconnected and pipes jumping around and you know obviously left unchecked that's only going to result in uh, in further damage and obviously if you leave it longer and longer ultimately the equipment tends to decide for you that it's had enough and typically as I've said numerous uh, times now generally the equipment makes that decision at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning as opposed to sort of 11 o'clock on a Tuesday um, so generally when you leave equipment to make that choice, Murphy's Law applies and it makes that decision at probably the most inconvenient time. Um, same thing applies to heat exchanger tubes and headers, um, also applies to valves, traps and, and other instrumentation. So if you're relying on your instrumentation, especially from the point of view of uh, process control, um, pressures might be really important. Those pressure valves or gauge, pressure gauges could be exposed to some very sudden spikes in pressure, which can obviously damage the uh, sensitivity of the equipment, ultimately leading to their accuracy uh, being affected, which obviously then can have an impact on your process. So that's probably the least of your worries, but ultimately if you walk around and, and hear this banging, then you want to be looking for broken pipe supports. And if you're already past that point, you probably really need to be doing something and if you don't, it is literally a matter of time and you'll have a rupture somewhere. Okay, now the other warning is you might think, well I don't have a problem because I can't hear it. Well not all water hammer is audible and certainly uh, that may well be the case, but in a lot of plants everything's lagged and insulated and it might not be immediately obvious, but damage can still be occurring, especially to sort of sensitive equipment. Now the root cause analysis of a steam system failure um, has found water hammer as the primary failure mode in two out of, the, out of three cases. So I want you to let that sink in for a minute. So two out of three failures in a steam system with a full RCA analysis has generally found that the uh, water hammer is by far the leading cause of these failures to the systems. Um, I know a lot of people over the years in New Zealand, um, air heaters have uh, been seen as a major issue in a number of industries, in particular the dairy processing sector, and, uh, and it's often the poor old air heater has been uh, seen as the, uh, the, the weak leak and the uh, common cause, and uh, just from personal experience, a large majority of those failures actually are directly can be attributed to poor condensate management and system control as opposed to um, the design of the air heater itself. Now, obviously you can, you can spend a whole lot more money building a lot more complicated and, uh, and, and more bulletproof heater. Um, me personally, I think a little bit more effort on designing the steam and condensate system so that you eliminate the water hammer and eliminate the cause of a lot of those failures is probably the smarter move. Um, to be fair, um, there are some less than ideal designs of heat exchanges as well that you probably want to consider and perhaps we uh, might look at doing a uh, webinar on that topic in particular. So uh, by all means send us some feedback on that if that is an area of interest. Now what we want to get to today is we're going to talk about the four main causes of water hammer and they are hydraulic shock, thermal shock, flow shock and then differential shock. So you'll notice the common element here is the shock term. So what we're really talking about here is the water hammer is a cause of some sort of shock or impulse in the system. Something's changing. 
and so we're going to talk a little bit more about each one of these uh, one by one. Okay, so the first one's probably the simplest and probably the easiest to get our heads around and, and probably the simplest to relate. And, and what we're really talking about here is where we rapidly close a valve. And the one that immediately comes to mind if you think back to the old house, if you for probably hopefully not so much in a new house, but if you think back for some of us who are old enough to live in an old house with old plumbing, um, you think about turning on the old tap in the bathroom at the sink and then you turn the tap off and you hear a big bang. Now I can, uh, I can, uh, I can picture a number of you nodding your heads and thinking, yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. So what's happening there is you've got water that's flowing down a pipe and obviously there's a certain um, mass of liquid flowing and moving at speed down the pipe. Now obviously when you shut the tap off, if the tap shuts off really quickly, then suddenly that moving fluid's got nowhere to go. Now in a liquid system, of course, water's by and large an incompressible fluid, okay, so it can't compress against the, uh, the tap and so you actually end up with a pressure pulse that bounces up and down the pipe because there's a sudden change, okay, and so we get a bigger impact based on the length of the column and then obviously the speed of the column. So if we have a small diameter pipe, obviously the, the velocity is going to be quite high, okay, and if it's quite a long pipe back to where the water's coming from, then obviously we have a long column. So number one, undersized pipes gives you higher velocity, high velocity is going to give you a problem. So the best way to look at this is to think about force, i.e. the size of the impact, is going to be directly proportional to the change in momentum. Now this shock or pressure wave is going to bounce around and so it's not just a single bang, it could result in actually multiple bangs and if you think back to the old tap in the old house, it was very seldom just a single bang, it was sort of a bang, 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 bang and then it gradually died down as that pressure energy, which obviously has got to be um, absorbed, um, slowly attenuates away. Now, for those of you that want to see the maths, we'll, uh, we'll put the formula up here. So, so force is proportional to the change in momentum. Well, what is momentum? Well, it's the product of mass and velocity. So the mass is how much fluid, the velocity is how fast, and the rate of change is very important, so how quickly that change occurs. So if you think about it, if mass 1 and mass 2, in most instances the mass is going to stay the same in this particular uh, application, then you've got velocity 1 and velocity 2. If velocity 1 is very high and velocity 2 was very low, i.e. 0, okay, then it's mass times velocity divided by the time it takes to make that change. If that time is very quick, okay, any number divided by a really, really small number gets a whole lot bigger. So for example, if we do it in half a second, then the change of momentum is multiplied by 2 as a, a factor in terms of deforming our force. If we do it in a quarter of a second, then it's multiplied by 4. If we do it in a tenth of a second, it's times 10. And so you can see very, very quickly, if that impulse is very, very quick, and with modern control systems, these things can happen very quickly, we need to be very, very careful of what happens. And obviously, if you've got the same mass of fluid, big difference between 1 metre a second and 30 metres a second, 30 times the force. So to put that in perspective, what do we need to do? Well, one, obviously reduce the mass or the smaller column, okay, so where is our valve in relation to our source? Okay, so ultimately it's about reducing the amount of uh, fluid that we're impacting. Now what we can do is in an industrial sense you might have a buffer tank in the middle somewhere, um, you know you don't want to have a hundred metres of pipe between where your, uh, your, your vessel is, where your water header is for example and where you're actually taking the water from. Now the other thing of course is you want to reduce your speed, so how do we reduce our speed? Well we need to correctly size our pipe work. Now we're going to give you some key numbers here, so best practice Steam, we want to keep that velocity under 20 to 30 metres a second. Now I've seen plenty of instances where that velocity is up to 50 metres a second. 
So straight away, the size of that momentum changes double for the same mass of fluid. So you can see how quickly this gets you in trouble. Now, flash steam, we want that under 20 metres a second, and then condensate one to two metres a second. Now, why do we want flash steam lower? Because flash steam is normally present with condensate. If we have that going too fast, that's going to pick condensate up and form a slug, which is going to cause other problems that we'll talk about shortly. So the, the only main downsides to oversizing our pipe work is cost, okay, and so if you think about it, and we're going to come back to this later today with the other applications of water hammer or causes of water hammer, we'll kind of come back and revisit this. Very, very important to get your pipe sizing correct. Now the other thing I want you to just see the thought now that we're going to keep repeating today is a bit of a mantra, is when you size your condensate system pipework, you obviously are going to size it based on what the expected duty is. What I want to remind you all about today is, is think about what happens when something upstream fails. And so what then is in that pipework and then is what's going to be the consequence. Now you might think, oh well if a steam trap fails I'm going to fix it. Well, for those of you that are running a factory, I can see you already sort of nodding your head and saying, well, there's the real world here where plant needs to keep running. They're not going to stop everything just so that you can have a window to fix a steam trap. And so the reality is what you need to think about from a system designer, a system maintainer and a system operator is how much resilience does my system need because how many steam traps could potentially fail before I'm able to have a window to fix those, uh, those traps that have failed. As an example, it could be a valve, could be any piece of equipment. Now the reality is, is depending on the nature of your process and the system that you're working with, you'll have different tolerances. Tolerances in terms of performance versus maintenance requirements. Then obviously, of course, if you've got a certain availability in terms of the functional performance of a piece of equipment like a trap or a valve, then what sort of maintenance regime are you going to put in place? And this is where if you're actually demanding a continuous operation and you don't want to tolerate a failure, then that needs to come through at the design phase and the specification phase and then be reflected in your maintenance and your condition monitoring of those assets. So very, very important to get your sizing of these systems correct. Now you may not need to oversize if you're going to get the specification of the system correct and have the ability to do a hot change out of a trap, which is quite achievable with the correct installation. So it's about understanding your specification and getting it right. Um, and obviously having good alignment between your operations, maintenance, and your engineering building the system in the first place. Now obviously the other thing is needing to increase your delta T. So the other way to get that number down is have a bigger delta T on the bottom. Okay, so the valve actuation speed, so really, really important start up and shut down. Do we just shut things off in a hurry or do we actually let things cool down and, and slowly wind down? Um, very, very important with steam and condensate systems especially to be very, very careful in setting and tuning your ramp rates both on start up and shut down. Okay, so ultimately the solution for hydraulic shock based water hammer reduce the impulse. So if you think back to probably mum and dad or grandma and granddad probably nagged you a little bit when you had the old pipe works hamming her away, is slow down and if you recall you can probably remember that if you actually took your time turning the tap off, the banging mostly went away. So what we actually did there or what you were doing is you weren't changing the length of the water column, you weren't changing the speed it was running at, you were changing the time. So we're increasing the time. Okay, so if we slow down that ramp rate on that control valve, we'll turn the tap off slowly. So the other cautionary note here is be very, very careful with the placement of non-return valves. You put a non-return valve in there, and then suddenly uh, when you have a pressure pulse go the wrong way, it, it can save you, but then of course if the pressure pulse hits that, it's gonna bounce back. So you have to think very, very carefully about getting the placement of these right. There's plenty of instances where they can actually create as many problems as they solve. So just a real cautionary note there. Okay, so the second uh, form of water hammer is thermal shock. Okay, and so thermal shock, this is going to apply to our condensate lines where we have two phase liquids. 
So uh, what we're talking about here is we've got steam in the vapour phase, typically it'll be flash steam in a condensate line, and condensate. Now what we want to remind ourselves, if you can think back, we've talked about these numbers before, but uh, in a condensate system, the specific volume of the vapour phase, i.e. when that's, that condensate is flashed off back into the vapour phase, is about 1600 times the uh, the volume of the liquid phase. In other words, the volume per cubic, uh, sorry, the volume in terms of cubic metres per kilogram, the vapour phase is 1600 times. Now, I've got there approximately, and the reason for that is, is the actual number varies depending on the pressure. Obviously, the uh, as you change the pressure, the actual change in ratio slightly varies. But by and large, you'll see that it's over three orders of magnitude. That's a very big change. So to put this in perspective, okay, one litre of condensate flashes into 1.6 cubic metres of steam or vapour. Or another way of looking at it, one drop, or one millilitre of condensate explodes into 1.6 litres. Now if you're in a confined space across the seat of a valve or in the back end of a steam trap, you're, you're talking about a couple of millimetre size orifice perhaps, and if you've got a drop of condensate there where you don't want it, the drop of pressure, that flashes off, that little drop of condensate becomes a very big volume very, very quickly. Okay, and so if you think about it, it's an uncontrolled expansion of a gas. Now in another definition, isn't that not the definition of an explosion? So I want you to think about that. So what we actually can introduce if we're not careful is a whole lot of mini explosions. Now if those mini explosions are occurring across a valve seat, ultimately over time the force of that explosion is enough to actually erode the valve seat. Now the same thing with the orifice of a steam trap or any other piece of equipment. Those little explosions, and if you actually start thinking about them in those terms, you know, we think water hammer, oh yeah, we're sort of used to that. Well, how about we rename them uncontrolled explosions and then see what our safety person has to say about that. I'd, I'd be very interested in some feedback if anyone wants to let me know what the look on their face is like. Any pictures would be greatly appreciated and we can perhaps incorporate that into the next webinar. Now, when a steam condensate line, or we have steam in a condensate line condenses, it will also create a vacuum. Now, obviously in the reverse, as the, condens as the, the vapour is condensed, obviously you get the reverse of the explosion, which is an implosion. So we create a very, very localised vacuum effect, which obviously has to be filled by either liquid or more vapour. And so obviously you end up with a void which causes an acceleration of fluid, and of course when that fluid's accelerating very, very rapidly, then it gets there, how does that fluid then decelerate? The answer is it hits a solid object and you get a bang, otherwise known as water hammer. Now I like to prefer the alternate term, uncontrolled explosion or uncontrolled implosion. Now this is a major issue when we have two-phase condensate is being injected into a condensate return line um, below the water level because obviously our steam is going to come through and is actually going to flash off some of that condensate and you get a percolator effect except it's not a very friendly percolator because as you percolate that through um, the steam is going to want to um, condense, but if any of that uh, steam is superheated, which can be the case if you've got different pressures at work, you can then end up with flashing off some condensate in the pipe and once again, as we said, instead of talking about flash steam, if we talked about an uncontrolled explosion of condensate into vapour and think about that occurring in our condensate line and the damage that that then can cause. So it becomes very, very important. So what are the solutions? Well. Always, and I couldn't, I should have actually, uh, oh no, there we go, further down, I did actually capitalise the word always. Always pipe condensate into the top of the condensate header. Never on the bottom, and never on the side. Condensate headers should always be horizontal. Do not use a vertical condensate header, just in case that last statement was in any way unclear or ambiguous. 
Now, have a, all condensate travelling in the same direction. So we don't want a condensate header where the takeoff for that header is in the middle. So if you can imagine condensate feeding from both ends and then having a common drain in the middle. We want that condensate header with the condensate on a slight incline preferably, so then it's actually going to self-drain. Okay, And all the condensate should be heading in the one common direction. Now of the three forms drawn there, I've drawn an arbitrary condensate level of half. It could be anything depending on the uh, nature of what you've got in the system. <laughs> Excuse me. And just to reiterate, in case it's unclear, we've got some nice brig red X's for what's not appropriate and a nice green tick for what is. Um, and it's unfortunate that we see all too commonly both of the two, both the left hand side and the, uh, and the middle one there being installed around the country. The reality is, is if you are bringing your condensate up into that header, that needs to, and if it is coming from below the header, that is fine. But what you need to do is if I, uh, I'll get my pen out here just to make sure that there is uh, quite clear here. You want the line, if it's coming up like this, to do this, and then come in the top like so, not up from underneath. Um, so fairly straightforward, You'd, you would think that that was uh, self-explanatory. However, you would be amazed how many installations you see like that up and around the country because it's cheaper and easier to do. In fact, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll make a small little confession at the moment. If you came to our research laboratory here at the university, um, we have tried for many, many years with our facilities management people to get them to correct such installations in our own laboratory with our own steam system. And their response has been, well, we've got professionals to design it, so therefore it must be right. Um, so if you were that professional that did design that, please correct your ways. It's kind of funny how they don't understand that we are also engineers and that we maybe might know a little bit about what we're talking about. So that's an ongoing battle that we will continue to wage. Um, but just to reinforce the point that there are too many installations up and down the country like this. Now I can appreciate that it might be difficult to justify that you need to change it, but by all means feel free to uh, substitute the words uncontrolled explosions. And, uh, and perhaps get your safety man on board, maybe then you can get something done about it. So what we'll do is we'll go on to the third cause of water hammer now, and that's flow shock. Now flow shock is really about incorrect valve installation, so it could be isolation or control. And so what happens here is if you have a control valve, or any valve for that matter, we should have a drip leg in front of that valve. Now the purpose of that drip leg is any condensate that is going along the pipe um, should be dropping into that drip leg instead of going through to the valve. So we should have dry steam hitting our valve and the reason for that will become very, very evident shortly. Now the other key thing to point out here, and I apologise we don't have an image but there's some really good images on the web. Um, and Due to keeping copyright clean and everything else, I haven't just stolen those images, um, but we'll give you some links at the end of the webinar where you can have a look at the ideal scenarios. But the reality is, is all steam pipe work should have a slight incline on it. And the reason for that is, should be fairly obvious, you want the condensate to have a slight incline so that condensate in the pipe drains to these drip legs. Now, the reality is, is you want that incline to be aligned with the flow of the steam because the steam is going to help push that condensate along the line. If you're trying to get water to flow downhill but up against the flow, you will get sort of a lake effect, if you will, where the wind blowing across the edge of the lake is going to blow the water on the top of the lake one way. And then even if you've got a current with gravity wanting to go the other way, you'll still get the water being blown against the current. And so for those of you that are keen fishermen, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, where you might have the tide going one way, but actually the wind the other, and you get all sorts of interesting effects going on. And so what we want to do very deliberately, and you'd be surprised how often people mix this up and get it wrong, you want the incline aligned with the flow, then the condensate will stick on the bottom of the pipe, then you want the drip leg aligned and obviously the condensate will hit that drip leg 
and then you'll have that removed, then you'll have dry steam. Now, of course, if we have just a few drops of condensate that get to our valve, what of course happens across that valve is we get a drop in pressure. Now, with that drop in pressure, if we were to go to our steam tables, we would realise that as a result, the, uh, the saturation temperature of that steam actually drops with the drop in pressure, which means the surplus enthalpy or energy, if you like, in the steam has to go somewhere. And where does it go? Was the steam gets superheated. Now, if the steam is dry, then there's nothing to evaporate, so the steam just gives a slight little bit of superheat and there's sort of no major issue. If, however, we have a few drops of condensate, those few drops of condensate are going to explode on the back end of our valve and cause all sorts of damage. Now with that explosion, of course, as we get a pressure pulse which is manifest in the form of water hammer. So this is our flow shock. Okay, and so it's when that condensate flashes across your valve seat, okay, that's going to erode the valve seat, which is why a lot of places up and down the country pay a uh, incredible amount of money to re-kit valves every year because they know the valves don't last, the control valves start to wear away and the wear is actually at the valve seat because we've had condensate get to our, st our control valve and obviously flash across the control valve. And of course, for those of you that are familiar with these systems, you'll notice that when your system's up to full speed, your pressure drop across your control valve is fairly modest. You're thinking, oh look, our pressure drop's near it, not very that great, therefore our flash percentage is not that great, so it's not really a problem, James. Well, what I want to turn your attention to, of course, is what about when you're starting up? So if you're running a 30, 40 bar system, on startup, you're going to be at one, two bar, and it's going to take a while before you actually go up. So you have a very large pressure drop across your control valve. Now with a very large pressure drop, of course, you get a substantial um, amount of any condensate present is going to flash off and it's going to cause a major deal of damage. And so once again, why do we say most of the damage gets done on startup? Well, on startup, that's when you have your biggest pressure differentials, that's where you have the highest flash percentages and that's when the damage gets done. Why? Because if we, instead of talk about steam flashing, we talk about steam exploding or maybe con exploding condensate is a better term than flash steam because um, that's actually what's happening. So on larger control valves, you need to be very, very careful because if you have no warm-up valve, the valve opens and obviously as you open the valve, you get a massive inrush of steam. So you have hot, high-velocity steam on one side and in the downstream, you've got a cold pipe. So what happens, of course, is there's a massive heat duty. That steam gets condensed very quickly, um, which is potentially also going to give you some thermal shock as well. Ultimately, the consequence of this is your poor old air heater where you, you, you're blaming the supplier of your air heater. Well, to be brutally honest and to be brutally frank, some of that damage has been caused by your control system and your steam installation and not actually anything to do with the poor old air heater manufacturer. Um, I recall actually being in a meeting um, chaired by a, a senior process engineer and he did make the comment once that the air heat is made of steel, so therefore it's strong, it'll be fine. Um, in theory, yes, steam is, uh, steel is strong. However, you throw multiple uncontrolled explosions, thermal stressing, um, fatigue, through this thing being constantly bombarded, ultimately that steel is going to fail, and when it fails, it's generally quite spectacular. And of course, as we said earlier, if it's going to fail, it's not going to fail at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday. It's probably 2 or 3 a.m. on a Sunday. And so very, very important that we appreciate the damage this can be caused, and these are the things that we should really be looking for. Now, if I'm alarming you, then that's probably a good thing because it's something that should be taken seriously. Now, if you need to use some of this language to, uh, um, to get some people on your site convinced, by all means, feel free to let me know and we'll give you a hand to communicate what needs to be communicated to the people that need to hear the appropriate message. So what's our solution to eliminate flow shock water hammer? So first of all, one, we need to correctly size our drip legs upstream of all isolation and control valves. So there's some really good uh, tables available. Um, 
online through the various suppliers. They've got some really good tables that say, look, if you've got this size um, steam line, then you should have this size uh, drip leg. It needs to be this diameter and this deep and so on. I haven't in, uh, listed it here, but it's something that's very easily readily available. And depending on your supplier, I'm trying to be vendor neutral here. Um, so I'll let you uh, explore. If you want some help on this, feel free to give me a call or send me an email. Now, the key thing is, is that drip leg needs to be deep enough. It also needs to be large enough in diameter so that the condensate doesn't get blown across it. It actually needs to catch the condensate. So obviously, if your pipe work is undersized and your steam velocities are too high, then the condensate will be blown across your drip leg. And so the, well, you could, I suppose, uh, I've got an assistant here suggesting we have a bigger incline. But the reality is, is if you think about this, uh, this uh, steam pushing the condensate along, you've got to realise that you want to avoid that liquid being entrained in the steam flow, and the only way to do that is to get the steam velocity down, and this is why the steam velocities that we recommend are what they are. Yes, you can get away with high velocities, but the problem then becomes, as you have your high velocities, you get more entrainment, and these other issues become more of an issue. Um, and the reality is, is if your velocity is high enough, it almost doesn't matter how big your drip leg is, you just cannot trap that uh, condensate and trap it before your valve. Um, now, obviously, on that drip leg, you need to have a working steam trap, and below the offtake point for that steam trap, you also want a blowdown valve. If you get any residual uh, scale buildup over time, you need to be able to blow that down. You do not want that going through your steam trap. And so this is all part of your maintenance regime to keep these things well clear, having a strainer upstream of your stream trap. Um, I'll give you some links at the end of the webinar where there's some fantastic online resources where you can look at how these things should be installed. Now as another rule of thumb, if you have a pipe diameter of 75 mils or larger, or three inches for those that still use the old terminology, you should or must actually have a warm-up valve. Now the size of the warm-up valve is going to depend on how big your pipe work or your system is downstream. Um, and so you might have a, a, a half inch, three quarter inch or one inch warm-up valve depending on how big your system is. Okay, the purpose of that warm-up valve is to control the ramp rate of your valve opening and closing. It's to equalise your pressure. And the other thing of course is, is that warm-up valve is a very cheap, typically it will be a uh, a ball valve as opposed to an expensive control valve, um, is your sacrificial valve. That's the one that you replace so that you don't have to retool or reseat your, uh, your expensive control valve. You know, your control valve's incredibly expensive, okay? Cheap little half inch uh, uh, warm-up valve, you, you set that up, you can replace that very easily. Now, if you're very clever, you'll actually have that with a couple of isolation valves around it, and so you can isolate and replace and do all of that without interrupting the rest of your system. Um, some of you will be familiar with your double block and bleed um, as, uh, as sort of the terminology that you uh, um, might be familiar with. Now, a little quote for you to think about. You might be familiar with the, uh, the old uh, ads on TV about speeding. The faster you go, the bigger the mess. Well, same rules apply to your uh, steam and condensate system. The faster you go with the steam and your condensate, the more damage you will do. It really is that simple. Um, and it's very, very important with all of this, if you separate the condensate from your steam, you can eliminate not actually manage or, or contain, but eliminate a lot of these issues. Okay, so the fourth form of um, water hammer that we're going to talk about today is multi-phase fluid flow systems or differential shock. Okay, and this is a major issue with condensate return lines. Okay, and so what we'll have is we'll have a steam velocity of 20 metres a second or less if you've listened. Um, some of you might have inherited a system that's perhaps a little undersized or maybe the steam con or the condensate line was correctly sized but then another process engineer came along with a plant upgrade and we added extra capacity here and a bit of capacity there but everyone ticked the box and thought I oh, know the condensate system's fine we can just leave it as it is and then over time the load on that system has crept up some of you might have a plant that might have been designed at a certain nameplate 
And then obviously everyone these days is trying to get the hidden plant and so we've, we're running at 120% at nameplate. Well of course what happens when we do that is all of our steam's going to be up at 120% which means our condensate's up at 120% which means our condensate velocities and our flash steam velocities are all that much higher and so this is where we can start to tip over into where these things become an issue. Now turbulence when we have condensate we're typically going to have steam and condensate and so you can imagine it's literally like the waves on the ocean or on the lake if you can imagine a 100 km an hour wind going across a lake, what happens to the surface of the lake? Okay, or in the ocean. Okay, and if you've read the weather report today, we've got a big cold front going to sweep up the uh, sweep up the nation. Got some high speed winds, and of course, all the surfers are really excited. Why? Because we're going to have some big wave action up and down the coastline. Why? Because the winds have whipped the waves up. Well, in the same way. The steam rushing down our condensate line, our flash steam, is very much like that, uh, that big breeze going up and down the country. And of course it's going to whip the condensate up into waves. Now if we have a high enough wind, i.e. a high enough um, flash steam velocity, those waves of con condensate are going to be whipped up to the point they could ultimately form a slug in our condensate line. And if it does that, of course, then that slug has steam going at 20, 30 km, uh, metres a second, so 100 kilometres an hour behind it, which is obviously going to build up pressure to the point that that pressure then has enough energy to accelerate that slug of condensate, not at one metre a second, but at 30 metres a second, or 100 kilometres an hour or even faster down our line. Okay, so ultimately at that point, our slug of condensate literally becomes a hydraulic bullet and that bullet is going to impact wherever it hits a bend. Um, we've talked about how air actually last week doesn't uh, change direction very well. Well these bullets of condensate don't change direction very well in pipework either. They tend to impact into valves or T's or elbows and of course ultimately that's how the damage gets done. Okay, so it's going to accelerate this bullet, it's going to pick up more condensate as it goes along, it's going to be like a broom going down the pipe and so that slug is going to gain mass which gains momentum and then obviously the pressure is going to build behind that slug and so we're building both our pressure and our mass which is going to build our velocity so we're actually increasing our mass, increasing velocity which obviously increases our momentum if we go back to our equation and ultimately when that hits the end of the pipe, our time is very, very sudden. And so we have a big number on the top, a very small number on the bottom, which gives us an even bigger number, so therefore our force can get quite high and obviously the damage gets done. So what do we need to remember? Well condensate, we want it to flow with gravity. Steam is going to be pressure driven. Okay, steam will condense with the heat loss, so it's going to increase our condensate load, lower our pressure a little bit, um, but ultimately these other factors all come into the mix. So what's our solutions? Well, one, correctly size our condensate line, so A, our, our wind, if you like, our flash steam velocity in the line is low. Okay, we want our condensate loading low with a good drain so that it's actually not building up in the line. We want a very, very small trickle of condensate in our line. Now, if we have any leaking traps, this is going to cause a problem. Because if our trap's leaking, we're going to have a whole lot of extra steam, not just flat steam, but some live steam coming into our condensate line. That's going to massively increase our steam velocity in our condensate line, which is going to increase our wind level, which is going to increase our wave height level. Okay, and that's our wave height level that's going to increase the number of bullets of uh, condensate that we have. So very, very important, if you are looking at your condensate system, um, you need to be very, very careful in sizing your condensate line. The condensate line ultimately should be sized based on your worst case scenario flash steam load. Okay, if you do the maths, it's the flash steam load that determines the volume of the uh, condensate line, not the actual uh, condensate loading itself. Now we did actually do some of these numbers in the flash steam webinar a few weeks ago, so I refer you guys back to that if you want to look at those numbers. Now the other thing to think about is depending on the nature of your system, how much 
uh, you've got in terms of opportunity to correct um, equipment that has failed. Um, if you've got a very long, um, long break between drinks, if you like, then you need to be very careful about what you do. And obviously one of the modern solutions there is actually having the ability to hot swap out a trap. This is where you have isolation valves upstream and downstream of the trap. So you flick those off, um, plug and play your trap and away you go. It's, it's actually the way to do it, but obviously you've got to build that into your system from the get-go. Um, now if you don't, then you need to be very uh, careful in terms of how you install your traps so that they can last, and then obviously monitoring and uh, keeping an eye on them. They're all things that we can look at. In fact, we may look at uh, perhaps doing a, uh, a webinar on how we manage um, um, steam traps and steam trap testing might be a useful webinar. So by all means, give us some feedback as to whether that would be a topic of interest. Okay, some additional pitfalls. Um, always remember condensate is a two-phase fluid. Any vertical rise will result in a plug flow. Um, attention to detail. Um, now, so here we've got the one on the left. If we've got to raise our condensate up to the condensate header, you'll notice that we've got the uh, condensate line feeding into the top of the header, which is great. But you'll notice the problem we have here is we'll get a lock of condensate in the bottom and that's going to block the flash steam from getting up until, of course, we get a build-up of uh, um, flash steam, which is going to increase our pressure after our trap until the point where it can fire that slug of condensate up into the header. Now, one solution is you can use what they call a damping pot, and this gives you the ability to entrain a little bit of steam with the condensate on a regular basis. Um, now, the alternative is actually better, is if you actually separate the two and uh, use your flash steam separately if you can. Um, you could potentially uh, put a vent condenser, um, for, if you like, on your uh, condensate tank and uh, use that to preheat um, some other duty rather than just having it all disappear down your condensate line. So there are different uh, solutions, especially if you're talking about traps after a heat exchanger and actually having a flash steam section with a, uh, a flash vessel to separate the two is obviously the best way to go about that. There are other pitfalls with that that you just need to get the engineering right. So as an example, if we've got shared condensate lines, what we want to share with you or talk through with you quickly today is if you think about your condensate and seam system, you've got to understand, think through how they're connected. So as an example, if we've got a high pressure steam supply feeding a heat exchanger, and uh, what you'll have is in front of your control valve feeding steam to that heat exchanger, you're going to have a drip leg. And on that drip leg, there'll be a steam trap. Now the purpose of that steam trap is to discharge a little bit of condensate into your condensate line. Now if that trap is working well, that discharge will be very, very modest and won't be an issue. Now, on the low pressure side of the heat exchanger, you may well have subcooled condensate. Now, the key question here is, is if those two systems share a common condensate header and a condensate line, what happens when the high pressure trap upstream of our control valve fails? Ultimately, you're going to get water hammer and it is going to be destructive. Why? Well, you're now introducing high pressure 40 bar steam. It'll be a little bit loss, less because you drop pressure across your, uh, your trap, but nonetheless, you've got a massive energy input into a cold pipe filled with subcooled condensate. It's going to be massive thermal shock and you're going to have water hammer. Very common to see this being done where you don't um, segregate the two condensate systems. Understand that if you do this, you need to be on top of those drip leg traps. You can get away with it, or ideally you want to have that, that condensate system feeding into your condensate tank separately so that you don't cause hammer. Too many times I see uh, the uh, pipe work on your heat exchangers jumping up and down literally because of this sort of thing happening. So it's obviously the cheap solution when you're building a plant to just have the one common condensate header and when you've got high pressure and low pressure all together, it's, it's easily done. And so you can go and look for this and you'll often find that this is one of the main root causes for your water hammer around these sort of heat exchanges. So some additional considerations. Basic rules of probability apply. So the more traps you have, 
you're going to have an increased likelihood of one of those traps failing. So what you've got to consider is what's your ability to make repairs. On your condensate system also needs to be designed with these constraints in mind. So when we talked about sizing the condensate line, if you need to tolerate a couple of traps failing, which is likely to happen if you've not got the right trap and so forth, or it's perhaps installed not quite in an ideal installation, the likelihood all goes up. And so these are all extra risk factors that you need to bear in mind. Okay, um, if you have a whole lot of traps fitted to a large heat exchanger is also going to apply. So very, very important that you get these things right or you make allowances with the sizing of your condensate line. Ultimately, if you don't, you will have water hammer and it will be destructive. Um, so here's an example. Here's a picture of what not to do. You'll see multiple traps under these uh, cases here, and this is the line out, feeding back and around into our condensate header. And you'll know, obviously, space constraints meant that the simple thing to do was we're going to bring it into the side of what is a very flat horizontal condensate header. Okay, well, when we have large um, heat exchanges, this particular one's an air heater, but could be heating a number of things, you'll have multiple passes. And what you need to understand is the duty on each of those traps is not going to be the same. The first pass is going to have the highest duty by far, and the last pass is going to have comparatively a very, very small duty. And so, of course, if you've got a one-size-fits-all approach, some of those traps will be undersized, and some of them are going to be grossly oversized. So it's very, very important that the traps are actually sized correctly for the duty on each of the passes. Then, of course, what happens is consider if one or two traps fail. What's going to happen to our condensate header? How long is it going to take? Do we have fair, um, spares? Can we actually um, hot swap them out? Do we need a uh, maintenance window to do that? These are all the sorts of things that you need to be mindful of. So the, the number one thing here to think about is we must have the space to correctly pipe the condensate, unlike this picture here. Um, then the extra separate question is how are we going to use our flash team? Um, are we going to subcool the condensate? then the very, very important consideration is what happens on startup and shutdown. Now, um, we don't have enough time today to go into some specifics, but it's something that we can look at in a future webinar if there's interest about going through some specific examples. Um, if, uh, if any of you have one in mind, happy to look at talking through that and, and looking at what we can do. Okay, so some common mistakes in terms of what we often see is one, incorrect trap selection, incorrect trap sizing, poor condensate piping, poor trap maintenance. Um, as we mentioned already, can you change out the traps easily? Um, getting good separation between flash steam and condensate. Do we have a flash steam vessel? And if we do, modulating versus fixed loads. These are all points that we've covered previously in the flash steam webinar. So I'll refer you back to that if you want more information. And obviously the other key thing with these sorts of applications is what happens to the condensate when you shut down? Because when you shut down, you, you've actually got to drain that away. Of course, when you shut down, the steam valve shuts off. Steam condensates, your coils can actually be in uh, under vacuum. And of course, if they're under vacuum, they're not going to drain away. So do you use a vacuum breaker? Now, if you use a vacuum breaker, of course, then you're going to introduce air into the system. And so then you need to think about managing your non-condensable gases, i.e. how do you then remove that air on startup? Um, one of the worst things I've seen of late is uh, um, a number of traps that were installed where the, uh, the air thermostatic vent on a float thermostatic trap was plumbed straight back into the condensate flash vessel and there was no way for that air to actually be ejected from the system. So we have a device that specifically is engineered to remove air only for that air to be completely and directly immediately introduced straight back into the system. So very, very important that these things are thought through very, very carefully and that these things are vented appropriately. So you need to think through the design and application, and it is very application specific, and you need to get it right. Okay, so in summary today, with water hammer, very, very important, ultimately comes down to staff training and procedures. So you want good standard operating procedures for start up and shutdown. Want all, helpful if all pipes are properly labeled and insulated to keep them safe. Um, installation and use of warm up valves. Remembering that most damage is done on startup. 
cold condensate left in process equipment on shutdown will cause you problems and damage on startup. The only variable in that statement is the degree of damage and the time required to, um, to result in that damage. It will ultimately cause damage and it's just a question of when, not if, um, you'll actually realise that that damage has occurred. So the other thing you can look at is proactive system maintenance in terms of pipe insulation, monitoring your steam traps, being able to uh, um, keep them well serviced and replaced and uh, refitted when needed. Remembering, I'll reiterate my point that I made earlier, um, you should be able to get seven, eight years life out of a steam trap if they're correctly sized and installed and managed. Um, isolation and removal of redundant lines and connections is also very, very important. Okay, from a system design and installation point of view, you want to have very clear steam system engineering standards. And I'll uh, put my hand up and acknowledge that unlike our current laboratory, which doesn't have good system design and installation, because clearly they didn't follow the right standards. Okay, so it's getting those standards right and getting buy-in from the right people to get those right. Um, best practice valve installation, have you got the right size pipe work, have you got the right size drip legs, have you got the right steam traps and blow off valves on those drip legs. Installing and the use of warm up valves. Um, best practice steam line installation, getting the sizing right. Um, steam trap placement, blow down valves, header layer as we mentioned, getting the right slope and the right orientation, the right connection points both in and out of those headers. Um, and obviously getting so our steam traps selected and sized correctly and obviously allowing for the flash steam that will be generated across those traps and remembering of course that it's not just your normal operation flash steam loading but what about our flash steam loading on startup which is where it will be greatest. So on non-modulating systems it's uh, a little bit easier, we can look at potentially pressurised condensate return, we can maintain the required static head or differential, we can think about start up and shut down and we can have pressurised flash vessels. Now on modulating systems we need to be very careful that we gravity um, drive our condensate systems, um, we don't want to have any back pressure, if we have flash vessels they must be vented to atmosphere with a vent condenser, obviously if we're looking to save energy. So look, there are plenty of online resources available, to, uh, um, depending on the nature of your supplier. I've put uh, Spirex Arco up there, they've got a great website, as do TLV, um, Armstrong, and there's several other suppliers that are also there. So if you don't have Spirex or TLV, which are, TLV, which are probably the two biggest suppliers in New Zealand that I'm aware of, there are other suppliers out there with alternative technology that's available. By all means, um, feel free to look at the material that they have available. Now I've put an additional um, option there for you guys, as a good friend of mine out of the US, a guy by the name of Kelly Paffel, who's a vendor neutral, um, his business has actually just changed, uh, changed, uh, changed names, changed businesses, he's changed uh, the entity that he's been involved with several times, but uh, his website there, Even, Evino Engineering or Evino Inc com is the website, he has some fantastic uh, steam best practice papers that are freely available um, on his website that they're there that cost you nothing to have a look at, so it's a fantastic resource um, and like I said he is vendor neutral in terms of uh, as to whether you're a Spirex, TLV, Armstrong or, or whoever um, may well be uh, the um, the equipment that you use. So uh, so some fantastic uh, descriptions of, uh, of what to do, what not to do. So where to from here? So in a couple of weeks we'll have another process heat webinar from Tim, so watch out in your inbox for the invite for that. On October 5th you can join me again for uh, uh, looking at control optimization and fan system tuning. And then uh, later in October, Martin will be back uh, looking at pump systems again. So just a reminder that these registration links will also be available on our website and the recording for today's webinar um, will be available off the ECA Business um, YouTube channel. Um, like I said, if you want any further information, my email address is down the bottom there, jamesn at yketo.ac.nz. And so feel free to email me if you've got any questions or um, whether you um, have had your interest peaked by some of the topics that I've just thrown out there today. If that's of interest, let us know and we can certainly look to make those available. 
Um, so we will stay on the line for a few minutes in case someone has questions today. Otherwise, thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time. So we'll give you a couple of minutes if you've got any questions. Otherwise, um, we'll see you in two weeks.